So my guest today is Colin Hoback, who's a filmmaker, producer, director. Specifically, the reason for this interview is a recent film that came out, documentary, I think it's a six-episode uh, series with HBO called Into the Storm, which he goes and takes a deep dive into Q, QAnon, 17. If you remember that whole thing that was going on the last few years. And uh, it's very interesting what happens uh, what he learns about it, and uh, we're going to take a deep dive into it today with the interview. So with that being said, Colin, thank you so much for making the time for being a guest on Value Tainment. Thank you for uh, offering the spot. background you're a filmmaker you've done a lot this is not your first rodeo you've done this multiple times so you know maybe first tell us why this intrigued you so much where you wanted to find out who's behind Q mm -hmm. well it was back in I guess September of 2018 you know I was peripherally aware of QAnon at the time yep um, it wasn't as, as as well known I guess as it is, is now <laughs> obviously um, uh, but what piqued my interest um, was the banning of QAnon on Reddit. Uh, there was a, a big subreddit uh, focus to this topic uh, that I knew virtually nothing about. Uh, and then that's when I said, well, what was something that was uh, you know, so, uh, so scandalous or so problematic that it warranted being banned? And might this be a sign of things to come? You know, my background was actually in digital rights. I'd spent the last 10 years or so um, kind of on the front lines fighting for digital privacy online. I'd made a film back in 2013 called Terms and Conditions May Apply, which is about the unholy alliance between corporations and the government and what they take away every time we click I agree online. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was my background thinking about digital, uh, free, uh, digital, um, digital privacy. And so I came to this with the same question around digital free speech. Um, so that's where I came at the story from initially. And, and of course, I was also fascinated by the idea of uh, you know who who was behind this whole thing, mm -hmm. and and might unmasking who Q was bring the uh, what was sort of a game still in 2018 to a logical conclusion. Yeah, again, uh, obviously a fascinating documentary. But uh, uh, if what if from your uh, uh, from the moment you started doing the researching and, and Q and would come out, what were some of the claims they made. I mean, I know them, I've followed them, I know most of them, but from your perspective, what were some of the claims that they were making that QAnon is about to unveil to the world on who's behind Pizzagate, et cetera, et cetera, if you don't mind sharing some of those? Sure. Uh, I mean, one of the things about QAnon that makes it a, a little bit tricky is it's sort of a big tent of beliefs. So it's not, if you talk to one person who's a QAnon follower, they may, they often will not agree on, on, on the sort of set of beliefs that they hold with someone else who's a QAnon believer. Um, so what QAnon really, I think, does, because the persona behind Q asks these questions, is it allows people to uh, sort of build up, it's sort of a choose your own adventure DIY belief system. Um, so, you know, I do think that the one, the one, uh, primary belief that that underscores the vast majority of uh, the, sort of the philosophy that most people who follow QAnon would, would agree on is that uh, they believe that the, the world is run by a, a, a global cabal of um, Satan worshiping pedophiles, you know, and that Trump was working with this government insider, aka QAnon, um, this is the belief, uh, to to bring an end to this cabal, and so this is the quote unquote plan um, that that uh, QAnon's are supposed to trust, and that at some point in the future the Great Awakening would happen, um, or the coming of the storm. I mean, there's a lot of these keywords and phrases that Q uses, and will often repeat that become um, staples in in um, in QAnon. But what one QAnon per believer might say about the storm is completely different, and it shifts over time. Um, you know, the, <laughs> you know, I like, you know, there's another one like Red October. And e even though uh, QAnon has, has, is dwindling now, 
um, every October is Red October for them. So, uh, so I think it's more like there's there's keywords and phrases that people ascribe meaning to, but they wouldn't necessarily agree on what that meaning is. So when you when you went in and you started, uh, you know, researching and take you know going into it to f learn more about it. What are, I mean, obviously, I know how the whole thing ends, and I think you even went on with Jim to January 6th. I think you were with him. I think you, you went in, a, but what were some yeah, of the things no, you ended with, up? I was with Jim on the 6th, documenting yeah. So it. walk me through what happened when you were going through, what are you learning more about them? You know, what did you end up learning about the whole thing? And uh, uh, maybe afterwards we'll talk about what the experience was like the first time you spoke to Ron. And Ron said, to, you know, were your reactions like, wait, what? You know, you were kind of blown away by it. So walk us through what you learned from the organization, and I'll go into a couple questions afterwards. Uh, what I learned from, from which organization? QAnon. You know, what you learn about QAnon and who's behind it, who's running it, uh, uh, more, you know, how this whole thing came. Was it really a high-ranking military personnel that's running it? <laughs> right. So, you know, the series, obviously, we spend a lot of time uh, over the six hours in the series breaking down the mechanics of QAnon, um, you know, where QAnon was sort of forged from, uh, which is Chan culture. Uh, Ron Watkins and his father, Jim Watkins, um, they have a, a lot of experience running the Chans. I mean, uh, Jim Watkins was, was in, in many ways, the sort of the OG when it came to, to um, uh, bringing it uh, both you know, to Japan and, 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 and partially to the States as well. Um, you know, he, uh, anyway, so they, they own and operated 8chan at the time. You know, QAnon got started on 4chan. It was there for uh, Q, the sort of anonymous insider who was posting there where no one could really figure out who, who this individual was, um, who was, uh, I think you would say that the term is usually LARPing, live action role playing, pretending to be some uh, this sort of secret government insider. But a lot of people believe that it is this secret government insider. And so this is part of the, the game is it does this person really have access to Trump or is this just somebody who's on uh, the Chan site? screwing with people, right? You know, and this is something that people do on the chans all the time, this kind of trolling, trying to get other people to believe that um, there's something that they're not. Um, that's, that's sort of the gold standard on, on, on these uh, platforms. So this is where Q is coming from. Um, Q moves from 4chan to 8chan pretty quickly uh, back in 2017. Uh, and then come early 2018, um, Jim Watkins and Ron Watkins and their website become these sort of stewards for, for Q. Uh, Ron Watkins gets mentioned in uh, the beginning of uh, that, that uh, transition, you know, and I think people start being like, all right, well, you know, what's, what's their level of involvement in all of this? Um, that's why I got in touch with, with Jim and Ron uh, in the beginning. It was partially to talk with them about the free speech issues that, um, that Q, was, Q was kind of drumming up um, in the, in the uh, internet circles. Um, but also because if anybody knew who was behind QAnon, you know, it would be those closest to the source. It would be those with the actual technical data. Um, and because everything is anonymous, it's, of course, very tricky. But that doesn't mean that uh, he wouldn't make mistakes, or that there wouldn't actually be IP addresses or other things that could help lead you to whoever was behind this, whether it was an individual or a group, which is also what most who follow Q believe. So uh, at what point... Uh, did you finally realize that they were the two behind the whole thing? <laughs> well, after that first time uh, yeah, visiting them in the Philippines, which is where they were running, uh, which is where they were more or less running their operations out of, sort of a mixture of the Philippines and Japan. But uh, after that first trip, I was like, gosh, these guys are, <laughs> these guys are suspicious. <laughs> you know, I, you I, got I, the feeling right off the very, bat? What's that? You got the feeling right off the bat. Right off the bat, yeah. The way they were answering questions, uh, the, the, what, they were, what they were hiding, sort of the clues that were coming from omission, their knowledge base, um, uh, the way they would interact, um, sometimes they would know too much, sometimes they would know too little. 
Um, and I don't think that they were really prepared for me that first time either. Um, and their chores, their stories completely changed the next time I, I went and filmed with them. They, they kind of recalibrated, it would seem, behind the scenes, which is also what someone who was working for their organization relayed to me. <laughs> so, um, you know, from that point on, it became a very much a kind of cat and mouse game with myself and with Ron and with Jim, you know, and Ron remained kind of uh, my, my top suspect until that summer. Uh, when um, he presented me with a pile of forensic evidence that pointed to the individual that he claimed was behind it, which Ron said it was Steve Bannon, and that he'd known that it was Steve Bannon since uh, nearly the beginning. And of course, Steve Bannon is, uh, you know, had, was sort of the architect of the 2016 Trump campaign and sort of a master of digital strategy. So he's a he's a good suspect if you're looking for a false sure. guy. Sure. Yep. Um, so at that point, I was like, okay, well, this is, this seems viable. You know, how did he, how did he put together this forensic trail? Is it, is it authentic or not? Was it Steve Bannon or was it Ron? You know, those were, those became my top two suspects. And we really parse out what happened and why I think that happened in the series. Ultimately, I come to the conclusion that, um, you know, the whole time Ron was more or less LARPing as Steve Bannon, trying to say, okay, who would be the right person to lead someone like Cullen to? And maybe he was a little, a little bit disappointed that uh, nobody had seen his awesome forensic trail up until that point. So, uh, you know, that's, um, that's the explanation that I arrive at in the series. And, uh, um, yeah, did, did <laughs> I think Steve... that, uh, you know, it, 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 was a very, uh, it was a very credible trail. You know, it it, it, uh, it it pointed in his direction in a in a in a way that was hard to um, hard to explain. Uh, but I think we come up with a good explanation in the series. Did, did Steve mind being the person? Like, did that become public where people were thinking it was Steve behind the whole thing? Um, sorry, say again. Did Steve mind that people accused him of being behind Q? You know, I I don't. I, I reached out to Steve Bannon and his, um, you know, his uh, sort of personal handler multiple times. I was trying to get an interview with him about this. You know, I eventually said, look, it looks like someone's trying to, trying to set you up kind of as the fall guy for Q. Um, you know, they, he was actually open to talking with me about QAnon, not because he was necessarily involved in it, but just because he was interested in the, the topic. Um, and that just never came to fruition. But... I don't know exactly what uh, what his, his feelings are on at this point. And I don't know um, since the election if Ron Watkins and, and Steve Bannon are talking. I know that Ron had been trying over the course of, of um, maybe many years to get in touch with Steve Bannon. And that's one of the things that you see in the series, this idea of meme magic, of something starting as just a game or a LARP and becoming real. You know, um, sort of pretending to have, the Q pretending to have access to the um, upper, you know, the upper echelon of, of government, the, the the inside circle of Trump, and then by the end of the series, you see that Ron and and, and those in his orbit actually do get that access. Um, and so, you know, in the year that's kind of followed, you say, well, you know, is is Ron in touch with Steve Bannon now? Um, you know, he was advising in those later days on on um, election fraud uh, issues. So, uh, I mean, it's it's a it's an unbelievable exercise in, in kind of will to power, I guess. You know, you know how sometimes you're sitting with a, uh, the, the psychology about a, a criminal who has pride in the fact that I did it. I'm the one that did it. But you've got to get him to a point where he wants to take ownership to make you realize how tough he is. And he says, look, you know, of course, who else is going to do something this genius of a job? You know, yes, okay, I did it. And it's a private conversation, let's just say. You're having with somebody like this. Was, was that the situation where he secretly wanted you to know that it was him behind the whole thing? Or was he walking on eggshells making sure you never found out that he was the one behind it? Because there's a big difference between you asking the right questions to getting to the conclusion that you want versus, no, I really wanted you to know that I'm the guy behind it. Which do you think it was? Well, you know, I think Ron is the linchpin behind it. Um, but but to answer your question, I I think that deep down he did want the credit, but ultimately he can't he can't handle the responsibility of what would come with that. So we will always be left in a situation where he has to deny, deflect, and dodge. But he's going to come as close as he can to admitting it. 
Um, and he's done that any number of times since the the series the series aired, right? Um, you know, he he messaged me at one point. He's like, Cullen, you know, I identify more with villains, or uh, you know, I, I learned a long time ago that creating internet personalities that are larger than life make for a more entertaining existence. Um, you know, and I think that he was. Yeah, he was he was coming as close as he could to admitting to it without outright just saying that he was he was behind it, um, and because I don't think he knows what the legal ramifications of that might be, um, I, there could be any number of reasons why he he wouldn't take it to that to to that um, to that extreme. But one of the questions I still have to this day is what were these overlapping networks working with him behind the scenes? You see some of it in the series, right? You see that General Flynn is actively reaching out to um, to uh, big QAnon influencers through DMs on Twitter, um, bolstering that behind the scenes. You see another general step in, General Paul Vallely. You know, he more or less wrote the book on PSYOPs and come 2019, 2020, you know, he and his, um, he and his kind of orbit of ex-military guys are, are bolstering things so um, it's it because these networks are decentralized and can organize you know remotely I think that's part of why you see uh, characters who are spread out across the globe here uh, and that makes it harder much harder to track much harder to know how they're communicating behind the scenes just how much coordination is really going on yeah it, it's it's amazing when you see uh, how easy it is to get the world to believe um, a conspiracy theory. I mean, you think about uh, on both sides, right? I mean, you, you think about how the world believed that Russia was behind the whole thing. The world be believed, you know, the whole uh, Russia dossier, and they're like sitting there saying, oh my gosh, this is really happening. The, the one side believed QAnon, like there's really something behind this. By the way, just out of curiosity. Well, well I think actually, you know, QAnon believers aren't all on the right. There's a. You're there's right. A uh, a, yeah. a not insignificant portion of, of those who follow Q who are who are on the left as well, um, and especially in the last year, uh, with with uh, you know, people looking for more control in their lives in relationship to everything with COVID. Yeah, um, you know we uh, there, Q also started to penetrate New Age communities, UFO communities. Um, you know, and, and 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 people who are part of those communities, they're on the right and they're on the left. You know, so this is not just a right wing. Um, a right-wing belief system. Yeah, let me ask you this, just out of curiosity. How much time did you spend on this total, beginning to end? If you would have put an hour to it, how many total hours did you put into this? Oh, my gosh. I mean, well, I can tell you how many hours of footage I had. How <laughs> so many? I shot over 1,600 hours. Of Holy moly. 1,600 hours is what you had. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and how long was it from the moment you started the, uh, uh, the project to the end when you were done, not cutting, editing, just to the end when then you started editing, cutting? How long is that time? So that, that was um, faster than I could have possibly imagined. So I had been filming on and off for two and a half years, um, and we were producing this thing entirely independently, you know, like credit cards and <laughs> hopes and dreams and wow. and whatnot. And Good HBO for you. came on in September of 2020, and the series came out in March of 2021. Um, I had edited Damn. about a feature film's worth at yeah. that point. I'd personally caught about 90 minutes. Um, so we put the series together in about five months' time. We cut the whole thing. Uh, so it was just uh, the, one, the most intense experience of my life getting, Solid. getting this out. But um, timing really mattered with this project. No question about it. So here's a question I want to ask you. I interviewed Greg Kading, who was, I think, originally he was working on uh, how uh, uh, Biggie got killed. Okay, and he wanted to find out what happened there. And through investigating who murdered Biggie, he learned about who murdered Tupac. And, and sometimes when you're working on something like this and you go in too deep, you learn about some stuff that you're kind of like, oh, my gosh, I really didn't want to know this about that person or this person. Did you, did you learn anything about anybody where you're like, whoa, this is extremely creepy? Do you ever feel like you got in too deep where you were trying to identify who's behind QAnon and then you realize maybe who's behind Deep State? You know, I, you see some of it in episode five. Um, there's the call behind the scenes with Jason Sullivan and Bill Binney. You know, these guys 
Bill Binney's an NSA whistleblower. Jason Sullivan was Roger Stone's head of social media strategy. They were trying to get in touch with Q. You know, that's sort of the moment where you see um, real power start to, real political power from DC start to merge with Q openly. Um, but you see at the beginning of episode five, Cicada 3301, you meet Thomas Schoenberger, you meet, um, and when I started to, to look into that world, uh, the world of these uh, sort of cicada guys, um, you know, you, you get a hint at Thomas's background, for instance, he kind of implies that he works for intelligence. Uh, that is a that is a shadowy organization that um, <laughs> it's, it's it's hard to really you know they they're all sending you signals of smoke and mirrors, um, and, and that's one of those organizations where you go like, well, do I want to look closer or not? Um, you know what? It, and, and this is an organization that was was bolstering Q behind the scenes and was there at the beginning. So when we're talking about overlapping networks, um, Cicada three three zero one sort of generation two of it, I guess you would say. Um, the one that's more or less helmed by Thomas Schoenberger. Uh, you know, what what exactly was their level of involvement? Um, and, and why were they there in the beginning? Uh, if you start going down the rabbit hole online of Cicada 3301 and, and Thomas, you'll you'll know what I mean. <laughs> I, I, what's their what's their main uh, uh, what they believe in Cicada 3301? Um, I mean, Thomas would say, you know, uh, he likes to say the phrase internal renaissance a lot. Uh, I, in my experiences with them, they're not, they don't all necessarily agree on uh, what, the, what exactly it is that they want, but it's a very smart group of individuals. I know I've met some of them who are accelerationists, right? So they want to um, maybe speed things up, get, get, to, get to conflict faster. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's because they think that's how we get off, uh, you know, in, well, I can give you one reason. Um, they think that if you speed things up and you create maybe a global conflict, uh, and I'm not saying this for all of the people who are skated, just a, an individual or two that I talked to from, you know, who, who identifies as that. Uh, and more when you talk about accelerationism, um, if you were to have a global civil war or a global conflict of some sort, um, Historically speaking, during times of war, way more money gets thrown into technology. Way more money gets thrown into technological advancement. So for individuals who want to see something like that, who maybe want you know space travel to get here sooner, um, they, w they would be less concerned with, with uh, sort of peace and more concerned with yeah. how do you get off this rock. So that, you know, that's, so there might be a, a portion of them who would be driving towards that kind of conflict. Um, but but again, some, a certain amount of that is is assumption, and I'm and I'm saying that uh, you know this is this is one of those rabbit holes that <laughs> when you ask me about yeah. it, that that I'm I, I'm looking at the down the edge of and going, do I really want to go down? There? Well, we'll come back to the Civil War conversation, but I want to continue with this. The only reason I ask this question is because I grew up with a family that believed in communism. That was their religion, and you know Karl Marx was the greatest thing since sliced bread. So. I read Communist Manifesto to get my beliefs as a communist stronger, as a person who was wanting to, you know, believe in this thing even more. And the more I read the book, the more I, more I argued the book, the more I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I don't know if I agree with this. What are you talking about? So I found myself, my own opinions changing after reading the book, instead of thinking if I read the book, my belief in you know, communism could potentially go higher. So the, the way I'm asking you the question is from the perspective of, did you go in, because you know how they talk about deep state. Okay, who is deep state? Every time you're like, well, the people who have power, because, you know, they'll, they'll say things like, there's a major, major percentage of America that doesn't believe Joe Biden's the president. It's not just, you know, 1 million, 10 million, 50 million. It's a very big portion, even some on the left where they say, so what do you mean you can't answer this question? This is very weird. We've never seen a president say, they're not going to let me answer the question. They're not going to let me talk to you. I'm going to get in trouble. I've never heard a president say something like this. So people are questioning that. So 
if, well, I think if, we saw something similar happen after Trump got elected, right? You know, I, a, a lot of folks on the left were kind of waiting for the Mueller report to, to release. Yeah. That was going to be the thing that yeah. was going to take down Trump, and then the election would all be reversed. Yeah. So it, it almost feels like the same thing playing out just... Yeah, just, but, um, but yeah, but the question I'm trying to ask you is the following. Stuff. Here's what I'm, I'm not asking you about the election part. The election part is the election part. You know, we know Joe Biden's the most popular president of all time. We all know that. That's 81 million votes. Uh, 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 you know, that's a record-breaking number. We know that number. What I'm asking you is, for you, you that have this experience, uh, the deep state, okay? So is really the president, the president, like I remember one time I'm talking to uh, 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 one of the CIA agents. I don't know if it was a director of CIA, but one of the CMO, I'm talking to one of these guys, and I said, I don't. Hayden, maybe he I, likes to. He does a lot of. Uh, yeah, I don't. Hayden. I don't know. Who, I can bring it up and tell you who it was. But I asked the question. I said, I don't know. You know how how they say like when Bush did the interview with Jimmy Fallon and he said, so when he became the president, did they take you to Area Fifty One? Yep. Do you know what happened to Kennedy? Yep. Do you know if we have any aliens? Yep. Can you tell me anything? Nope. Okay, so I don't know if you remember that exchange with the interview. So, but I don't know if I'm comfortable having a president that's potentially only going to be in charge of the greatest country in the world for four years, telling him everything, and then he's going to leave? I don't know if that makes any sense. So it almost like you need somebody above that to, that's going to be there for a long time. When I interviewed the chief disguise officer of CIA, uh, Jonah Mendez, who uh, her husband was the, the one with Argo, that whole thing that was taking place, but I'm in D.C., right in front of the White House. I'm interviewing Chris. So what's the great quality of a great CIA agent? Do they need to be good in sales, charming? What makes them so special? She said, great in sales, charming, closer, convincing, conniving, all of that except one thing. I said, what's that? When they save the free world, they don't need the recognition for it. Like, they don't care to get recognized. And they're going to read in the paper the next day, and their name's not going to say, CIA agent, da 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 da, save the world, right? Okay. So if there is a deep state, okay, you know, whether it's a Soros, Koch brothers, when they say, which president do you want me to buy this time? You know, that joke that was going on for many years, or Obama's, or Clinton's, or Bush's, or whoever. This is not a left or right thing. Let's just say there's a deep state. Did you ever, re you know, researching QAnon because they were getting in all this criticism, did you all of a sudden say, man, shit, there is a deep state? I just don't know who's behind it. I'd love to go investigate this. Did that ever happen to you? Well, I think that when you, the term the deep state can have different meanings to different people, right? You know, if what we're talking about is a, um, like, a, a group of people in D.C. who are just there kind of calling the shots, regardless of if the president is right or left, if we're talking about, you know, institutions that, that, um, you know, whether it's the CDC, or, you know, or or the EPA, or whatever, whatever institution you want to pick, um, you know, that 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 uh, is trying that needs to make sure they have a budget every year, <laughs> that, um, that that is trying to protect their own. Um, you know, these 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 large organizations. Uh, I mean, of course, they're that have a lot of power. The NSA, right? You know that also, or or the three-letter agencies that are all kind of jockeying for power against each other. Of course, those things exist, and of course, they have um, far-reaching powers. You know, this is one of the reasons that I was so concerned when I made terms and conditions may apply. What 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 can happen if some if an organization like the NSA is able to know literally everything about a journalist or a politician, and how how can that information be leveraged, and who gets access to that information? So um, if the deep state is the term to describe those institutions or the individuals who are kind of operating behind the scenes as politicians come and go, um, you know, then, then, it's, a, then it's just a, a, a term for describing you know, basically the establishment, just a new way of saying, new way of saying that. Have you, ever, uh, uh, ha have you ever been inspired after doing something like this where you spent 1,600 hours of footage, two and a half years? Did it ever, ever get you to say, you know what, screw it, let me go find out who's really in charge? Like, who's really pulling the ropes behind closed doors? If there is, I'm going to debunk it because I don't believe anybody's there. And I'm just going to go figure this out. Or do you say, that's one area I don't want to screw around with because my life could be ruined? 
I think that when you're dealing with intelligence agencies like that, I mean, they're masters of smoke and mirrors. Um, it's, it is, uh, they, they, if they're talking to you, then you have to ask yourself, why are they talking to you? Why are they telling me what they're telling me? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what is sort of the, the origin of this narrative? I mean, I think there are a lot of journalists out there who have sources, you know, in high places in government who, uh, when those sources tell them something, you know, there's, they want access to that, but it's hard to know what the motives of that individual really, really are. So that, that is a very difficult, a difficult thing to investigate. Um, and I, uh, usually a lot of time has to pass before you're even you're able to get any sort of sense of what might have happened you know after certain people have died or or the the stakes related to that information just don't aren't as relevant anymore uh, i mean we still don't really know what happened with jfk right <laughs> yeah, we're, we're constantly told yeah, yeah it's all going to be released all yeah. the information is going to come out and, yeah. and yet still to this day it it, it it hasn't so there are some secrets that that go beyond the grave, it would seem. But uh, if you're trying to investigate something like that in real time, um, it's it's very, it's a very dicey game. Well, I, I bet if you announce that that's what you're gonna investigate, <laughs> I would be willing to bet not a single single life insurance company would underwrite your policy. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you, and I'm in the insurance world. So here's, here's why I'm asking this question. Uh, I'm fascinated by what you did because uh, how quickly did an organization like this take? Like, do you remember when Anonymous was like, oh, my gosh, Anonymous made another video? <laughs> like, hi, we are the Anonymous. Do you remember that? So it was oh, sure, like. Yeah, we, we talk about Anonymous in the series. Yeah. yeah we, um, uh, and, in fact, actually, the person who claims to be the founder of Anonymous is, is, in, the, is in the series, Aubrey Cottle, um, who kind of came out of. He, he, he was he had a Chan that he also created in the early days called 420 Chan. Yeah. Um, which is sort of where Anonymous got its start. And then you know, QAnon happened, and then he kind of came came out of, I guess, re <laughs> retirement or something, and, out of, from, and uh, was like, "All right, well, I'm going to do what I can to try to try to take this thing down." And so I chronicle a little bit of his uh, his campaign against both QAnon and and against the Watkinses. This model's been around for a while. It's not a new model. It's mo it's a model that's been that goes way b b back even before. Uh, our times. No, I asked this. Yeah. I, all those guys in Anonymous now, you know, there there's so much paranoia uh, among the people who were there in the beginning. They all they're all concerned the others are government assets at this point, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, if nothing else, there's there's a lot of uh, division among the ranks. Yeah, the, the I remember I interviewed John McAfee at his house, and I don't think I've met somebody more paranoid than him. If you see his interview, he's sitting yeah. there right next to me with a gun. He's sitting there smoking a cigarette. He's got four or five former Navy SEAL Rangers in the back with AK-47s, M-16s. A guy knocks on the door. One guy comes out. And uh, I've never met anybody that uh, paranoid because at that point, he, I even asked him a question. He said, he said, do you even trust your mom? I don't even trust my mom. I'm like, wow, you've reached at that level. I mean, how do you... So I can only imagine to be in these types of communities. But the only reason I ask this question for me is the following reason. So uh, uh, when the discussion comes up about Trump, right, I think of three presidents. Take Trump, take Kennedy, take Reagan, okay? What do the three have in common? Uh, somebody tried to take uh, the life of uh, Reagan. Uh, they missed. They were successful with Kennedy. Of course, we have Lincoln as well. And then Trump is a anomaly where, you know, so I, some people thought maybe that's going to end up happening with a guy like this because he's so loud and he's going to piss off the wrong person, right? Okay, obviously, everyone's glad that didn't happen because the last thing you want is something like that. It would be uh, catastrophic for many different reasons. But what do those three have in common? Maybe if you also throw Lincoln in the camp, what do those four have in common? Well, first I was thinking was was Kennedy also in Hollywood, but he's not really in Hollywood. No, but he, he did have a celebrity status similar. In to a him. big way, yeah. I mean, he would be probably the biggest celebrity president we've ever had, right? I mean, I think he would be in that league with Marilyn Monroe, all of that. But what do they have in common? None of them needed money. None of them did it for money. None of them could be bought. Reagan had his own money. Kennedy's had their own money. 
And if there is a deep state, the deep state probably doesn't want to have a leader that doesn't need them because the deep state likes to choose people that they can fund because if they fund them, they can tell them what to do. And that's the thought of some people that I bring on as a guest and they present this argument to me. And I sit there and say, if there is a deep state, they would not like a person like uh, Kennedy. They would not like a person like Lincoln. They would not like a person like you know, or Reagan, they would not like a person like Trump. They got to figure out a way to not give them that kind of power because they lose a lot of their liberties. They, they lose the ability to play the political games that play. And by the way, this is nothing new. Politics and playing games and playing power has been going around for thousands of years. So sure, yeah. the question here yeah. is like, who the they? Is. That's what I'm curious. Who is they? That's the that's the question. <laughs> and I think that it's I think that it's incredibly complicated and how all of the and what what Who's going to make money from what? Who has what political agenda? Who's, you know, obviously anyone who has a lot of money is going to have a lot of influence. Anyone who has a lot of influence economically is going to, is going to be jockeying behind the scenes. So um, usually it, it, you can trace it back to who has the most to lose. <laughs> and whoever has the most to lose will be, will be fighting the hardest. And if they have the resources, then they'll, I mean, money, money goes a long way, right? It, it, it. It has more. It has. It drives most of these engines. If somebody, so if somebody agrees, you know, you're going to look at. I mean, we saw the the influence that various billionaires have had in campaigns. There's a reason that no Jeff question. Bezos bought the Washington Post. Yep. A lot of this stuff is based on influence, and there's lots of different yep. inflection points for that influence. Whether it's the institutions themselves behind the scenes, where people have connections, whether it's connected in some way, shape, or form to the revolving door between, you know, corporate America and and the institutions themselves, and whether and 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 the sort of I guess as long as we're talking about Reagan, the trickle down from the billionaires and and their desires at the end of the day, uh, you know, and I think that to your point, if a candidate runs, say it had been Bernie Sanders, right? Would he, what would have been the dynamic with Bernie Sanders and, uh, and sort of the billionaires who are out there, would he have taken that money from them? And if not, what would be the opposition to a candidate like that? You know, I think you see a similar thing um, with, with, with Donald Trump where, okay, he can fund his own campaign. So does that pose a, a viable threat um, versus establishment candidates you know, Hillary Clinton is, an, is the definition of an establishment candidate, right? Um, so she would be very um, well funded by uh, all of these special interests. Uh, that's, I guess, the other term. So I guess if you, you know, that you, you might use to describe uh, how how they get the policies enacted that they want that, that um, you know, keep Wall Street happy or keep whoever happy that, you know, wants to make money. That's why they put so much money into political campaigns. I mean, I always say this, if we if you really want to do something about what you're describing as the deep state here, the first thing would be campaign finance reform. If you can get money out of politics, you start to clean up this whole the whole <laughs> entire thing all the way down. You think that'll ever happen? <laughs> um, it's it's not impossible. You know, uh, do I like the idea that a congressman spends 80 percent of their time trying to raise money rather than spending all of their time, uh, you know, uh, reading the bills and engaging with their constituency, um, and that when they raise that money, of course they're beholden to that money. No, fuck no, I don't like that. I agree with so, you. Yeah, you know, if we could get rid of that, yeah. it would make all the difference in the world. But um, you know, I, I and I wish that more candidates would run on that platform, you know, on a campaign finance reform, because that that is sort of the source of so many of the issues that we experience. Um, if you want to talk about where all of the influence comes that seems to not serve the people, it's because it's special interests protecting their own interests, using, uh, yeah. using money and getting policies that, that um, benefit them. Yeah, if somebody gave you an open checkbook and said, hey, uh, I want to hire you to go do this call and you, be, you decide who you want to recruit, would you uh, consider taking the uh, uh, offer of uh, investigating the deep state and doing a documentary on them? Oh, I mean, like I said, you know, I think that it's what we're talking about here is, is sort of the establishment. And actually, I already made a documentary that breaks down why this whole system is so broken. It's called What Lies Upstream. Um, I used I used the uh, or I, I spent several years in West Virginia embedded with the political, um, I guess, the political elite there, you would say, Um after this kind of water contamination happened. And you just watch as all the special interests and all the money kind of comes in and then guts any kind of protections in that state. And you can see how um, the lobbyists work in that film. You can see how 
uh, how the politicians kind of bend to their will. And then you can see how the people who are working at the institutions, um, sort of the analogs there of the, the EPA and the CDC at the state level, completely fail the people because of the political influence over them. So, um, you know, I, I think that I've already <laughs> made a film that, that, that unpacks what's, what's happening there. You know, at a higher level, if we want to break down what's going on with the, with, with the billionaire class and how the billionaire class influences politics and, and all in sort of the tapestry of things that, that make it so that we end up with policies that, are, that aren't good for the average person. I mean, that's, you, could, you could make documentaries about that <laughs> until, until the end of time. I think the real, I, I joke about this, but really, I, you know, I think a lot of documentarians would be out of a job if there was campaign finance reform. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot of truth behind that. Do you think QAnon is done? Like, you think they're going to show up for 2023? Uh, are they going to be back at it again? Or is it going to be disguised at a different organization that shows back up? What do you think happens with a QAnon? More closer to the latter. Okay. So one of the things that Q did at the very end, like, like a week and a half, two weeks before uh, the election, and on the election is more or less when Q ended. Um, also when Ron Watkins stopped running, uh, <laughs> stopped, stopped being the admin of AQ. Um, you know. But anyway, the, what Q said was, uh, there is no QAnon, right? There's Q and there is no, there are nons, there is no QAnon. It was kind of like putting a, a, a death nail in this thing, and it became a gaslighting technique from that moment on, so that anytime someone said the phrase Q or QAnon or calls something QAnon, he, you would you would then hear oh this person doesn't know what they're talking about there is no QAnon this became the the, the like the the clever re, the, the pseudo clever rebuttal I guess to to any time somebody um, like myself made a series about it or said the phrase QAnon which is of course just just ridiculous but they're doing it because Q said that and I think the reason that Q said that is multifold you know going into the election um, you know with no degree of certainty who was going to win, but perhaps fearing that from their perspective that Biden would win. Um, you know, being labeled as QAnon perhaps would um, would would make one a, a, a pariah. Uh, the, the, the PR around Q is not great right now. Um, to be labeled as QAnon is still pretty toxic. Uh, so what we've seen now instead is people just using all of the keywords and phrases from QAnon is a kind of uh, just obvious code to let others know that, yeah, actually they are still totally QAnon. They still, they're still part of the club, club's still going, and the club is getting glossier. You know, there was just an event this weekend called the Patriot Double Down. Um, you had, uh, if you compare that event, which had $600 tickets to get into it, uh, it was very uh, high production value across the board, um, you know, from the, the trailers to it. And, and I think they had the, I'm not going to say his name wrong, but like Jim Cazavelli, you know, the guy who played uh, Jesus and Patrick. Caviezel, and, and Jim the, Caviezel. Jim Caviezel, yeah, yeah, he was there talking. You know, Flynn was supposed to be there. Uh, he pulled out uh, at the last second. But you, you had some, you had a lot of high-profile people making an appearance there. Ron Watkins headlined this event, and it was a QAnon event. Everything about it used coded QAnon language to advertise itself. There, you know, where we go, one we go all. Uh, you, it, it had, uh, in the logo, it was a, a, a seven and a queen of hearts, the cards, you know, which, which adds up to 17. And that was not the logo. Yeah. Yes. What, what's the event called again? Tell two cards with a seven and a Q. What's the event called? And, uh, the Patriot Double Down. Keep going. So I'm, I'm watching this. Last weekend. Yeah. You know? And so everybody's organizing and they're figuring out how to become political animals yeah. and take over the political landscape. So what Q is doing now is it's moving to real political power. And Ron Watkins is running for Congress. That's, you know, that was announced in the last week and a half. Um, so if that gives you any case, if, if the guy who I think we proved to be behind Q in the series is now running for Congress, if we saw someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene be able to get into Congress a couple of years ago, running on a, what was largely a, a, you know, a QAnon friendly platform, um, we're going to see more QAnon candidates. They might not call themselves QAnon candidates, but that doesn't mean that they're not. And do you think the opposing side is going to use that against them? They will try to use it against them, but I don't think it will make much of a difference. Um, you know, I think, like, in the case of Ron, 
he can lie about things or he can and be caught in those lies. He can fool his followers into thinking that, you know, some some amazing thing is right around the corner and that it never seems to pay out or rarely pays out. And it's almost like the more he tricks them, the, the, the more they like him, like the more clever they think he is. So I don't know if if being labeled as QAnon will be terribly detrimental in the upcoming election cycle, because what they're going to be focusing on won't be any of the QAnon related beliefs. They're not going to talk about a global cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles. That's not going to be a talking point. The talking points are going to be digital censorship and election integrity. And they're not going to worry about anything else. And for all of the people out there who have been banned from Twitter or banned from Facebook, um, they're angry as they should be. And and they're going to, it's going to be easy to mobilize those individuals. And if they feel like a QAnon candidate is, is going to be the champion of those issues, it's not even going to matter to those voters, I think, that they have this whole other um, stable of, of beliefs. Um, you know, they'll, they'll run on just those two ideas. And I've already seen in, in these conferences, you know, early on, the censorship really hadn't ramped up yet online. And as it did, um, they were really able to, to mobilize around that. And most of the speakers, it didn't really matter what the substance was of what they were discussing. All that really mattered was that they weren't allowed to say it online. And the people who were in the audience shared that sentiment. And so do they have the potential to be successful in this upcoming election cycle? I, I think that that the left didn't realize, and some of these tech giants had no idea what the, that that their actions online would would uh, would result in 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 sort of the opposite, I guess, of whatever it was that they were seeking with that. Yeah, uh, do you think there's a just out of curiosity? I mean, you've obviously spoken on censorship, cancel culture. You've talked about a lot of those things as well in different uh, various uh, forms. Do you think there is a uh, 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 an end game, not an end game. Do you think? Do you think this whole concept of cancel culture, what's going on with you know we, Dave Chappelle or whoever it is that's uh, you know they're trying to be canceled? Do you think cancel culture and censorship is sustainable to use as a way to bully people for a long period of time, or do you think eventually people are going to be like, listen, stop it, it's it's too much now, it, it's got to stop? Well, the. Um you know what I'm asking, right? Yeah, no, I do yeah. know what you mean. Yeah, I mean, it, you can only, you can only take it so far. And what's happened now is that people have who were, you know, banned on on these platforms have moved elsewhere. You know, my concern was that those other platforms, the alternatives would also not be allowed. <laughs> that there couldn't even be another place for people to go. Um, is it sustainable? I mean. Culture, you know, it's a constantly changing beast, and there's a lot of people on the right who know how to how to leverage that as well. You know, I think that there were some very savvy political actors who saw this impulse coming from big tech um, and from from um, this sort of the the, the, the culture of um, particularly the far left that that could be beneficial politically. You know try to do things that will will speed it along to the point that more cancellation or more more censorship will happen so that you can then point at that and say oh look at look at what's going on look at how we're we're um, we're being silenced but the only way you know you have a right at all is you it's not it's the it's the extreme tests it's something like QAnon that tests whether or not you really have free speech right it's not the it's not it's not easy political dialogue um, I mean, there are questions about what kind of speech online, um, you know, should we have anonymous speech online? I think we should. But what does it say that somebody in South Africa can use anonymous speech to influence somebody in America? Um, that's just a new problem that we yeah. haven't really grappled with. Um, but anonymity isn't the problem. You know, an anonymity is, 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 is um, the sort of a, the, a, a, it's been the, a, a staple in in civil rights in the past and in and in um, our ability as a society to to improve 
um, you know, it protects people who who uh, whistleblowers and other things like that. It's how it's often how more transparency can be brought about. And people don't need to go on Facebook. Like people can go on Facebook and say the most like rancid shit. You know, and they don't need the the uh, the shield of anonymity. So anonymity is not not the issue here. You know, and I actually don't think that the country would be nearly as polarized as it is. I know that it wouldn't be if, it, if digital privacy hadn't been eroded, right? Because it was the erosion of digital privacy over the last 10 years and the ability of both the government and corporations and political operatives ultimately to see everything that we're doing and then manipulate that. So I used to get asked a lot, well, why does it matter what I, if they're monitoring everything I do everywhere I go and, and build a profile yep. on all of my beliefs, yep. right? Why does any of that matter? What's the cost? Yeah. Well, all this is the cost. The, the hyper-polarization that we experience right now, that's the cost. It's the algorithms being able to use our fears and insecurities against us. Yeah in the form of these psychometric profiles to drive us into echo chambers so, so that people don't, so people think it's, think it's almost like a crime to talk to someone from the other side, you know? Um, and that, and, and the algorithms also provided a, a, a you know, a politically opportune moment for uh, operatives in DC who knew how to, who knew how to capitalize on that or for people like Ron Watkin to understand how to, how to how to feed the algorithms and and drive attention. So for those who know how they work and know how to manipulate them, they can build something like QAnon. Um, would something like January the sixth have happened if if people hadn't been able to be mobilized using beliefs that kind of bubbled up out of the chance, um, or and then found their way onto YouTube? Um, if people weren't on YouTube driven towards more sensational um, and extreme content. I don't think so. Uh, so if I was to start with something here, I wouldn't start with, with limiting the speech online. You know, the speech is a symptom, like people being really, the, the things that people are saying online right now and just the level at which things have gotten is a symptom of not having privacy online. And I would start by restoring rights rather than taking them. So you would give you would give guys like uh, 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 what was his name? Uh, Yiannopoulos. Uh, 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 what was the guy's name? Something Yiannopoulos or uh, an Alex Jones or a uh, Trump. You would you would say let those guys have their platform. Uh, it's not a good idea to censor them. Let them speak. You know, I think that I think that um, these bigger platforms like Twitter and Facebook and all of that. On the one hand, you can say, well, they're companies, they're private companies. They, they decide what kind of speech is allowed on their platform and what kind isn't. You know, Section 230 enables that. Um, okay, but look at the scale of these companies. Look at how many people are on using Twitter. You know, if that is the place where all of the information, if that is the sort of hub of information, if that's the place where everyone goes to get it from, well, then we need to kind of rethink what that space is um, and what rules govern that space. You know, is, and, and, and once we do that, we can, we can establish, okay, well, you know, but for where, we're, for where we're sitting right now with Section 230 and all of that, they can do more or less whatever they want. Um, so I think that we should have a conversation, though, about what are the, the responsibilities of, of these networks. Um, because they're companies, because they're private companies, they're responding to culture to some extent. How you, know, what you, got, you got people sitting in positions of power going, oh, don't blame me yeah. for this stuff. Right? But, but what, do you, what do you say? What do you say to someone who may say, I mean, uh, come on, Colin, you know, uh, to say that these guys have so much power now, you know, uh, newspapers used to have that back in the days or radio had that back in the days of people reading a single paper. Right. So the argument yeah. would be that the would the argument be speed of information being shared, speed of information uh, uh, like I have an opinion, boom, five seconds, I can have it out. And then within 10 minutes. You know, a thousand people can see it, hear it, share it with others. So the shareability factor changes the game today. Access changes the game today. This changes the game today. Everybody's a citizen journalist today. 
makes it a lot tougher. So how different? Last question before we wrap up. Really curious. I mean, you know, people are allowed to, the people are allowed to assemble. They're allowed to organize. Sure. And they're allowed sure. to use the Internet to do that. Yeah. Whether or not you like those ideas, that's, that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be allowed I to agree. do that. I agree. I mean, listen, I left Iran for specifically uh, because we couldn't do that. You know, you were uh, afraid to go assemble at a church to you know, worship whoever your God was. You, you were, had to be careful on what you could say about Khomeini. God forbid if they found that you're an anti-Khomeini guy, you, you and your family had to be very careful with it. So, yes, we escaped for many reasons. How different do you think 2023 election is going to be, uh, 2024 election is going to be, uh, than what we had in 2020? Will it be very different or will it be similar? Well, I think that... Um I think that it will be different in a, I mean, I could go into all the ways that I think digitally it will be different. Um, sure. We didn't really see deep fakes be a big you know, factor in the, the last election cycle. I think that they're going to increasingly, but I mean, cheap fakes you can do now and, and they can kind of feel like deep fakes. And I saw people in QAnon spheres believe videos that were completely absurd um, that, but think like, oh, no, that's, that's John Podesta. You're like, you don't, there's no face, there's no anything. It's just a blurry image with some sound in the background. That's not, that doesn't prove anything. But if, if, if individuals will, will buy that, well, gosh, they'll, they'll buy a video that, you know, puts his face onto someone else's body, and, and then people will just believe whatever videos already align with their biases. And since we've already been driven to the echo chambers, it's more likely that, you know, the left is going to believe certain things, the right's going to believe other things, and they're not going to agree on which things are real and which things aren't. And even video evidence is going to, going to have that same kind of problem around it. Um, and I think, that, I think that we're primed now for, to go into an election cycle where people just aren't going to trust the, trust the results. I, I really hope, I wish that, you know, the Biden administration and the states right now would do paper ballots in every in every state. Um, you know, that's that's ba every vote backed up with a paper ballot. Just anything we can do to put more trust in the election. But that that's if you thought the last two election cycles, you know, people people didn't trust the results. That that's going to be massively amplified. And the reason I don't think that anything is going to improve, and I don't think the polarization in this country is going to de-escalate, is because the, none of the problems that have caused this have been solved you know we uh, unless unless we get privacy rights online and stop feeding the algorithms with personalized data um that that allows for this level of manipulation you know nothing's going to change unless people from the right and the left are able to start talking again and and and, and can kind of even just agree to disagree um unless we can get to that kind of a place i, I just I think that we're, we're headed in a, in, a, in a potentially dark direction. You know, I, so. I, I announced $5 million. I made a $5 million offer, $2.5 million uh, to Trump, $2.5 million to Obama to have a three-hour sit-down and have a conversation together to address so we can, you know, address each other's issue, whatever it has been, because those are two people we haven't seen face off, to see if we can possibly unite. Because I think those two guys, nobody looks at as Biden as the face of the left. People still look at Obama as the face of the left, and people look at Trump as a face of the right today. Uh, uh, I think we got to figure out a way to get these guys in a room to talk, whoever these guys are. Just get in the room, talk, uh, to teach others that if Trump and Obama can in the same room together, maybe others can as well. I think we need a little bit more. I agree with you. Uh, Listen, uh, Colin, really enjoyed uh, the interview. I wish we had more time together, but I really enjoyed talking to you. We're going to put the link below to uh, the mini series, the sixth episode, Q Into the Storm, uh, where they can go visit that. And uh, we'll put the information as well for people to be able to find you. With that being said, thank you so much for coming on and being a guest on Value Tainment. This was thank great. Thank you so much for uh, the, the very thoughtful conversation. Anytime. Appreciate you, buddy. Take care. Cheers. So what do you think? Q, Anon. Would you learn anything new? Comment below. If you like to give it a thumbs up. And if you like this interview, you may inter enjoy my interview with Alex Jones, I think a week after he got uh, suspended, permanently banned from 100 different social media sites. I interviewed Alex Jones on 9-11, maybe three years ago. And it was fascinating. If you've never seen it, click over to watch it. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.